Why haven't remote viewers found the UFOs? Hey guys, Patrick here with Bedit. Just a question I had. And the alien bodies, right? If they could see this stuff, I'm curious why they haven't found this stuff for us. You know, let's put all our effort towards that because a lot of these same people in the UFO community are also in the remote viewing community, um, if you'd like to say it that way. And again, I'm open to all of this. I don't know the limits of humus, human consciousness. I've never tried remote viewing, right? I would love to actually, actually give it a try. Be open to it. See if there's something there. I don't know, but I am curious about that. If people can remote view, find us the UFOs, y'all, right? You're going to hear a story about someone finding a, sub a nuclear submarine in Russia, um, right? There's stories of people finding planes and a continent map of Africa in the middle of nowhere, um, you know, just putting a circle on a map and there was the plane. Okay, well, let's do that with UFOs. What are we doing here? That's a serious thing. So anyway, we're going to talk about Project Stargate, okay, CIA funded. Um, we got a lot of clips Jack Sarfati, um, the remote viewer number one, Uri Geller is even involved, um, the men who stare at goats, okay, um, it's the movie, right, it was based on some true stuff, um, it's very interesting, um, so we're also going to be looking at, um, okay, what is his name, Joe Mc, McMonagall, I think that's how you say his name, Anyway, I got a ton of clips, guys, that we're going to be looking at. You can, again, this is a long rabbit hole you can go down uh, for this stuff. And again, I'm open to it. There's a lot of stuff here. So um, let's just dive in because this is a long one. All right. First thing we're going to start with is what is remote viewing in case you're like, I don't know what that is. And then Wikipedia says not to be confused with remote access software. So like remote viewing uh, someone else's desktop screen. Don't confuse it with that. This is much different. Uh, remote viewing, or RV, uh, is the practice of seeking impressions about a distant or unseen object purportedly sensing with the mind, right? Typically, a remote viewer is expected to give information about an object, event, person, or location that is hidden from physical view and separated at some distance. Hello? UFOs, alien bodies, tell us where they're at. I don't know why they're not working on that. Um, so we're going to be looking at uh, this. This page, The Wikipedia page on this is absolutely fascinating. You can find the early background of where this came from. Uh, it says in the early occult and spiritualist literature, remote viewing was known as teles, telestinesia. I think I'm saying that right. And traveling clairvoyance. Um Rosemary Gilly described it as seeing remote or hidden objects clairvoyantly with the inner eye or an alleged out-of-body travel. So very, you know, this is old, right? It goes back to mid-19th century and probably before that. Um, so there's a lot of stuff here. It's, it's fascinating. So again, I'm going to put links to all this. And I'm going to put a link to how you can learn to remote view if you want to do it. I personally want to try to learn in person. But there is videos you can try to do it through, and I'm going to attach one in the links in the description so you can take a look at it. Let's keep an open mind. I don't know. It's fascinating, right? Again, we don't know the limits of our consciousness and the limits of, you know, human capabilities. It's not like we've just hit a wall and yeah, we know everything we know. I mean, we don't. So anyway, there's uh, Stargate, right? Project Stargate. This was, um, we're going to watch a video on it here in a second. I've got the CIA has all these documents on it um, that you can find and read. And again, I'll put links to this. You can feel free to go through it all. There's a lot um, through FOIA requests. They've released this stuff and it is on their website. So the first thing we're going to um, watch is Jesse Michaels again has a wonderful video on this. If you haven't, if you're not following this guy, follow him. He's the guy that did the David Grush documentary. Okay. Right. This thing only has 24,000 views. I don't know how it doesn't have more. It's, it's actually a fascinating video. So you know what? Let's enough of me blabbing. Let's jump in. We're going to watch two parts of this. There's a long intro that just gives a nice overview of what remote viewing is. And then we're going to watch a, a part of it about Stargate. And again, there's so much in this uh, video. You should, you should watch this all, to be honest with you. But we're only going to watch part. Let's go. 
But when you get right down to it, nobody knows what consciousness is. There are functions of mind that cannot be described purely by brain process. In today's episode, we get freaky with parapsychology. If you're unfamiliar, it's basically a fringy field of physics that involves the study of mind over matter. A Russian woman can move objects across a table without touching them. To learn more, I spoke to two mind-bending individuals. The first was Paul Smith out in Cedar City, Utah. More of this is true than you might think. Our plane on the way over here got struck by lightning. Coming into Vegas? That's even rarer. That's Rob Lowe. Yeah. Why is Rob Lowe with you? Because I taught him how to remove you. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> Paul worked in the CIA's Stargate project. Stargate was a psychic spy program that ran from 1972 to 1995. Paul and others were used as remote viewers, basically psychics that could draw up, only using their minds, things like Russian nuclear bases and lost American hostages. Right off the bat, the program had some notable successes. Joe McMonagle, remote viewer number one, described in vivid detail a novel Russian nuclear submarine eight months before it was publicly revealed. And Rosemary Smith identified within a three mile radius a lost spy plane that had crashed and fallen under the treetops in Zaire. President Jimmy Carter recalls being shocked when he figured out that a psychic medium accurately channeled the location of the plane. Next up is Herb Metz, a parapsychologist that works out of Princeton University in New Jersey. Herb spent over a decade at the Pear Lab, Princeton's anomalous research center, specifically focused on an experiment called random event generators. Here's an example of an REG. Basically, the experiment involves a graphical interface showing ones and zeros produced by a binary, pretty simple computer. This simple computer is tied to something that's provably random in quantum field theory, something like radioactive isotope decay. And it basically is random. It just goes up and down, just like a coin toss. So basically, over a long enough time scale, you should see the same amount of ones as you do zeros, maybe with a normal standard deviation. But what this experiment shows is that if you actually have an observer present, they can actually have a statistically significant skewing effect on the output on the screen based on their intention. So I was feeling the other way. You're letting go of that. I sincerely hope that nothing freaky happened to you while watching this episode, but I can assure you that if it did, it's because you're not subscribed to this channel yet. So do that now. Leave a comment with any weird anomalous shit that's happened to you. Definitely subscribe. Again, great guy. Let's go to Stargate. A little bit more um, about Stargate. Okay, let me get my timestamp here. Yes, I'm reading notes, y'all. Reading notes. Let's go. Where it's all in the brain. In 1972, laser physicist Hal Putoff was doing experiments with New York City-based psychic Ingo Swan. Swan had been having out-of-body experiences since he was a child. He thought that this ability, if honed properly, could be turned into a rigorous protocol around remote viewing distant objects. When Swan accurately remote viewed the readouts on a highly shielded cork detector, it got the attention of high up officials in the Defense Department. In fact, it freaked out the postdoc that was in charge of that machine what are you doing to my machine? <laughs> you know? This prompted the CIA to launch the Stargate project, a psychic spy program to do things like find Russian nuclear bases and lost American hostages. Let's talk about some of the successes that are declassified that you can talk about um, in Stargate. So one example is uh, the Typhoon submarine and Joe McMonagall. Joe McMonagall was perhaps the best and most effective remote viewer. He was referred to popularly as remote viewer number one. When Joe is on in a session, it's astonishing the stuff he gets. The first thing I'm getting is sort of a, an overhang kind of a thing like this. How do you think you developed your skills for, because uh, you see, really seem to be the best remote viewer you know, maybe ever. Psychic functioning itself is a survival mechanism. In the beginning, the people who kept small tribes of humans alive were shamans. In 1979, Joe was tasked with remote viewing a huge impenetrable building in a shipyard off the White Sea in Russia. He described a massive nuclear submarine in the works. It had the ballistic missile tubes in front of the sail or, mm -hmm. you know, the superstructure on the sub, uh, which was ne unheard of at that time. And everybody thought that was crazy and it was pretty well dismissed. Eight months after that, those, pro those sessions were done, 
the Russians floated out the Typhoon, the biggest submarine ever built, and its missile tubes were in front of the superstructure on the Pretty sun. Pretty crazy. Exactly as Joe, Joe described it. Another big success came that same year when both the Russians and the Americans were scrambling to find a downed Tu-22 spy plane under the treetops in Zaire. The plane contained highly sensitive Russian cryptic equipment. The Russians wanted to find it, obviously. The US wanted to find it, obviously, right? But they didn't know where it was, and the satellite footprint wasn't big enough or nor was it successful in getting through the triple canopy forest. Dale Graff, one of the Stargate leads, had a woman named Rosemary Smith remote view the plane. He showed her a picture of the Tu-22. We're looking for a plane like this. And he said, it's crashed somewhere here. And he gave her, gave her a whole map of Africa, the entire continent, mm. right? And he said, see if you can find it. And she essentially made a circle on the map. And it was a three square mile area. And the plane was inside that. That's pretty so crazy. Cool. Yeah. Paul had many successes of his own, like this one in 1987 during the Iran-Iraq War. The tasking was describe whatever is most important for us to know about within the next few days. I started describing this uh, vessel, which reminded me of an American destroyer. I perceived an aircraft off at a distance flying around, and then it dropped two little cylinders with stubby wings on it that made roaring sounds that flew around and eventually encountered this vessel. And the vessel is full of smoke and flames and leaks. This is interesting because this is a different type of remote viewing. Okay, just pay attention. So one side is all bent and crumpled. I go home for the weekend. Monday morning, I get a call from Skip Atwater. He says, Paul, where's that session you did on Friday? And I said, well, it's in my safe drawer. Why do you care? He said, you haven't seen the papers yet this morning. No. I opened up my copy of the Washington Post. U.S frigate hit by exocet missiles fired by an Iraqi jet. Paul had described the USS Stark incident in frightening detail just days before the attack. Was there any way to link your vivid description of what actually happened to possibly stopping it or? Yes, that would have been possible. And in which case the incident wouldn't have happened, which would have been great, would have saved 37 Americans. But then the next time something like that happened, they'd say, well, they told us there was going to be an attack last time and nothing happened. You know, why should we believe them this time? <laughs> you know, it's a, kind of a no win. That's the perfect. Well, <laughs> let's think about that. that. You could have saved Americans, right? And now they're talking about remote viewing the future, right? You're seeing the future. So it's different from the present, right? Can you remote view the past? That's interesting. I don't know. How does that work? So I don't know. What do you guys think about that? I think if you can say something, say something. Saving lives is more important than, you know, you being right, in my opinion, right? Proving to people you're right. I, that just, that doesn't sit well with me. Nothing against this person or that thing, but that's interesting, right? Um, all right again, put links to this. You can watch this whole episode. It's phenomenal. Let's jump ahead here. Now, there's something called the Monroe Institute, okay? It's, it's, uh, it's one of the foremost authorities on remote viewing and consciousness, okay? Uh, and we're about to learn a little bit more about it. Th this is sort of the reason I want to make this video. I've been seeing remote viewing everywhere. And Sean Ryan on his show, he had Sean, uh, Sean Webb um, to talk about this. So let's get into it. So the Monroe Institute is one of the, if not the premier research institutes for consciousness expansion. And on the East Coast, at least, if not in the country. Now, that begs the question, okay, so what is consciousness? And consciousness is that place within us that we observe from. It's a separate space from our minds because like if we talked about the last episode, we talked about one characteristic, one phenomenon of consciousness versus our mind's knowledge. If we can take our consciousness and see what our mind is doing with our emotions and stuff like that, see our mind in operation, that proves that consciousness is separate from our mind. And so we're not exactly sure. We don't have a complete definition of what consciousness is. No one agrees on the definition of consciousness. That's there are true. a lot of scientists out there that say consciousness is an emergent property of the complex system of our brains, and if our brains weren't there, we wouldn't have consciousness. And while that's true to a point, it doesn't necessarily say that consciousness is just in our brains. 
And I feel that the evidence that science is putting forward is that consciousness is actually out beyond our bodies as well as something that we experience through our bodies. But it, when you reach out out of your body into consciousness, you can do things like remote viewing and to uh, see into the future, to discern information, which by the way comes from a study that was done 90 times in 33 different independent labs in 14 different countries that showed human beings can literally look into the future regarding a task that they're doing now. I couldn't find any information on that, so please let me know down in the comments uh, what you think about that. If you go to the Wikipedia page, um, and again, there's more information on this. It's actually not, there's more science to dispel it than prove it. So again, I couldn't find that. But what's interesting is you could see the future. So what does that say about time? Like, there's no free will. It, time is just set. The future is just set in stone, what it is. We, we don't get to decide what happens that's interesting i don't know what do you guys think about that right this this by bringing up remote viewing and consciousness now all of a sudden you're talking about time and future remote viewing why can't you remote view the past right about something you don't know right again why haven't we found the ufos and the alien bodies y'all right or tell us, you know, look back at Roswell, look back at this, you know, the Italy crash, look back at all this stuff. I don't understand it, right? So anyway, just trying to understand. Again, I'm going to put a link to this so you guys can watch the rest of this interview on Sean Ryan as well. Let's jump ahead. We got more stuff. Um, this is, you know what, we're actually, we're not going to watch this one because uh, we already heard this story. But I'm going to put a link to it because that same guy talks about uh, Joe McConaughey and that story about the um, submarine and, and all of that. Um, and it's interesting. If you don't want to watch the full interview, you can just watch that clip, right? So anyway, now this is straight from Joe McConaughey, May 19th, 2021, the Monroe Institute. Okay, so remote viewer number one, right? He is the original, the OG. Um, let's hear from him. Hello, world. <laughs> Sounds like the whole world Hello, is Joe. plugged in out there. Uh, the talking. But you knew that, right? Because you can remote view. You know the future. Uh, just kidding, guys. I'm going to throw around jokes. I don't mean anything by it. Again, I'm open to all of this. Supposed to pre present today is about how I got into the uh, into the Stargate program. It was kind of an interesting problem because. When I originally came back from overseas, I'd been overseas probably 14 straight years, not quite, just about. And I had done six uh, hardship tours. That means uh, one. And uh, so when I came back to the headquarters, I didn't expect anything other than uh, some some menial work there. And what happened is it was, a, was supposed to be a surprise. I got promoted to a warrant officer, chief warrant officer at the headquarters, which uh, kind of stunned me. And I was put in charge of my MOS for the world, which is, I won't tell you, that's not a, a small job. Um, everything that uh, everybody was doing in terms of my MOS, my military occupational specialty, I was in charge of. That's uh, vehicles all the way to making sure that they were properly housed in their missions and everything else. Um, it was a considerable job on top of which they sent me to uh, Fort Benjamin Harrison when I got there and uh, put me through the advanced course in, uh, in computer science because everything was going to computers. And I think that's why I got stuck with it. But in any event, I became the also the advisor to the commander, three star general and the commander of the intelligence for the army, which was the AXI, the Army Chief of Staff for Intelligence at the Pentagon. Guys, the reason I'm playing this, just to give you a little background on this guy, right? He's not just some nobody that came out of nowhere, um, right, to do this. In any event, I was expecting to stay in this job until I retired. And I suddenly got a call one day and it was somebody I didn't know. It was Skip Atwater. He was a first lieutenant at the time. 
And uh, he and another man, a major, asked me to come over to Fort Meade and they wanted to talk to me. So I went over there. And what they did is they had a whole lot of information. A lot of it was classified and a lot of it was unclassified. And it ranged from newspaper articles on psychics to uh, very highly classified papers that the Russians had, uh, that we had gotten from the Russians and the Chinese and a number of other places on uh, psychic functioning. And they gave me a cup of coffee and sent me down at a table. And, and that's, that's something that's uh, talked about in that Sean Webb interview is that the reason we got into it is because we thought the Chinese and the Russians were getting into it. So it's like, oh, we got to look into this, see if there's something here. We, we need to also look at it because maybe they have something going on that, that we don't. Right. So that's interesting. Not that they thought there was something viable, but they thought there was something viable because other countries were looking at. It. Does that make sense? It's not like they had seen something and gone. Yeah, we need to do that. They saw their countries. Oh, what's going on? Let's also try that. See if see what's going on. Put all these printed, all this printed material in front of me and they said they wanted me to read it or look at look it over is what they said. So I did. And I spent about two hours doing that. And uh, uh, after which they came in and asked me uh, what I thought of the material. And I said, uh, reading the material, it, it kind of turned me off, actually. I said, I didn't believe in all this mumbo jumbo stuff. But uh, some of the papers I said were intriguing and they seemed to be very threatening in terms of what they could or couldn't do. And so my response was a formal one where I said that uh, I didn't believe most of what I read, but in terms of threat, I thought it was a de definite threat against the country if it was used or targeted against Americans and that uh, something should be done about it. So that's interesting, right? He didn't believe in this. I guess he didn't know he had the ability um, so it, it is said that anyone can remote view. We all have the capability to do it. So it's that that's kind of cool that that's out there because it's not like, oh, it's a special thing. Right. Only certain people can do it, you know. So that's interesting. Um, I do kind of appreciate that aspect to it, which makes me again want to actually give it a try. So I'll let you all know when and where that happens. It's, uh, you know, hey, I'm, I'm open. I'm willing to give it a try. All right, let's move on to the next clip. All right. This is interesting. Um, I just saw this clip the other day, and I honestly couldn't get it out of my mind. And let's just jump in. I moved back with my... So this is Jack Sarfati, okay? Uh, you may know who he is. You may not. Um, Google him. You'll find out more about him. Um, let's jump in. Mother, when I'm about 13, in Brooklyn, and that's when the phone call happened. The, the, uh, I'm a... The, the title here is, I received an alien phone call from the future. That immediately got me to click on it. Phone, uh, and my mother's somewhere out. It's a summer night, it's a nice warm summer night, probably. So he's home alone. Summer night, he's about 13, he's in Brooklyn, and he gets this phone call. August, and uh, the phone rings, and I pick up the phone, and I hear, uh, you know, first, you know, I could hardly I hear just like, um, like, you know, like coordinates, you know, like numbers, like seven, six, uh, uh, yeah, but in a strange voice, uh, but very low, and then and I'm trying to listen, I don't quite, you know, can't get it. And then the volume increases, Volume increases. And I hear also clunking, like switching circuits. Oh, I also had a, I was reading a book at the time on the early computers, mechanical relay computers called switching circuits, Bell Laboratories. Mm. So I'm, I'm hearing like the clunking. So it's like, it's like a computer, okay? What I thought, you know, what people thought of computers, well, 1953, hardly anybody even knew what a computer was, but I did, you know? Uh, and so, uh, and then it gets louder, and then Stephen Hawking. <laughs> <laughs> you know who Stephen Hawking Oh, yeah. Is? Okay, well, was, you know what he sounded like because he couldn't talk? The mm -hmm. metallic voice. It's the, it's the Stephen Hawking voice 
1953. Okay, I'm hearing this right, and it says and identifies itself as a computer on board a flying saucer from the future. Hmm. Back from the future. Okay. Verbatim. <laughs> well, I, I'm sort of paraphrasing, but yeah, I mean, not, yeah, I'm paraphrasing. I, you know, this it said long, it was on a flying saucer, though? Yeah, it was says, well, I think it may, I think it said it was on board a spacecraft from the future. Okay. It may have said flying, but, you know, I was into flying saucers already by then. So it was, mm -hmm. you know, space, mm -hmm. from the, it's a time machine, time travel. Right away, I'm told it's time travel. And they said they've, that uh, they are contacting uh, f uh, several hundred, I think they said even 400, I think I heard the 400, young receptive minds that they want to teach their technology to. Bear in mind what's happening now, you know, with the congressional law and stuff, right? Mm. They want to teach their technology. And at first I thought, you know, because I was a pretty streetwise kid, and uh, I thought it was, you know, it's a joke. I thought it was a joke. Because I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not... Out of touch with reality. I mean, I, 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 How old are you? I was 13, <laughs> 1953, 13 years. He said he's not out of touch with reality. But at 13, he says he gets a, you know, thinks he gets a phone call from an alien spacecraft from the future telling him that they're picking 400 young minds to teach, you know, their technology to. So 13... They pick 13-year-olds, which is interesting. Why not a little bit older, right? Kids in college. I don't know. Again, just I'm open, but this is interesting. Oh, and I'm trying to think who's, okay, go, okay, I got the joke. You know, who's doing this? And then I, suddenly it occurs to me, none of my friends of my age group were as smart as me in terms of science. You know, they weren't into all this stuff. They were like normal kids. I was an abnormal kid. <laughs> I was a nerd. But these kids, yeah, they're just all American, you know, back. And they think, well, what does this have to do with remote viewing? Just keep listening. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it couldn't have been a kid. And also, they none of them had access to the kind of technology that can make a cold metallic voice, right? And I think it's got to be an adult. You know, this is like going through my mind, you know, and uh, and then so, so that could be dangerous. Yeah, you know, I was, you know, knew that there may be weirdos around, and uh, but then it said, so I, yeah, I let it continue, and it said I had to now tell them, out of my own free will, if I wanted to participate in this project. <laughs> And then, you know, did you ever see this thing with, you know, like you had the little devil on one shoulder and the angel on mm. the other shoulder and say, do it, do it, don't do it, don't do it. You know, like, uh, and, I'm thinking, and I'm thinking to myself, no. I think, you know, internal dialogue, no. But then I feel like an electric shock go from the base of my spine to the back of my head here. You know, like it's, a, you know, like a, an electrical feeling. And I hear myself saying, yes. All right, this is interesting. And then, and then they say, um, oh, and they also said that I begin, uh, they said, good, and now you, they said, I will begin to meet the others in 20 years. So it's got to be time travel. Right? They're telling me what's going to happen 20 years in the future, 73, right? So, so this happened to him in 1953, and he's saying in 1973 he'll meet the rest of these 400 uh, individuals, right, in 20 years. And that's where it gets interesting. And then they said, then the voice says, go out on your fire escape and we're going to send a ship to pick you up in 10 minutes. All right. So at this point, so I hang up the phone. And at this point, I'm scared and I'm, you know, excited, right? The kid, you know. Yeah. And um, so I run down into the street. It's a hot summer night. This is New York. This is. Uh, he didn't go to the fire escape. They said go to the fire escape, not run out into the street. Flatbush. This is. Um, it's an Irish, German, uh, Italian, Catholic neighborhood. You know, big church, the Irish bar, the Italian baker, uh, the uh, German bakery where I get these Charlotte Russes and everything. And you know, brownstone, and it's brownstone. It's, everybody's out. You know, it's a warm, beautiful night. Everybody's out on the street, the mothers with their kids and the uh, strollers. It's a, it's a whole scene out of like a Broadway musical, right? <laughs> and uh, I had a gang. You know, I was like, my gang. I was, I'm looking. So I find, 
I run, a, I, I find Neil and Norman Legata. Okay. Uh, Neil is, is, is my age, you know, 13, and he's a strapping, he's a strapping Italian kid, you know. I mean, you know, he's a, like, you know, he's a strong kid. Mm -hmm. And his little uh, brother, uh, uh, Neil, Norman, I'm sorry, Norman is his brother, who's like 10 years old, the two of them, so they're part of my, and then I run into my Winky, Winky, who is a tough Irish kid, <laughs> And our mothers, yeah, was like, well, we grew up together. And the mothers, all the mothers knew each other. Uh, and Winky, he's like, a, he's like a price. He's a really tough Irish kid. Like he'd say, yeah, punch me in the stomach. You know, he had the abs. You know, punch me, you know. And, uh, and uh, he, he, when I went to Cornell at uh, age 16, he joined the Marines. Okay, he was in the Marines. He was in Vietnam again. Well, no, like this is before Vietnam. No, Korea. Wait a second. No, this is before Vietnam. This is uh, 56, yeah. Okay. This is, yeah, this is uh, right after Korea. So, and he, uh, then when he got out of the Marines, his real name is Al Bro, and he became a very well-known uh, New York City NYPD homicide detective. Okay. I, I don't know if he's still alive. He may. All right. So, these are my, so we all said, the flying source is coming to get me, coming to pick me up. And, you know, so the four of us kids, we go up to my place, within the 10-minute period, and that's it. Nothing ever happened. Nobody showed up? No, they didn't show up, as far as I know. <laughs> so what's interesting about this is later on, he starts working with Hal Putoff, right? Also part of Project Stargate and all this stuff, and he basically gets into the same group of people um, that can remote view. And Hal Putoff apparently is also one of these kids that got the phone call, you know, just saying it all connects. It all connects if you dive deep enough. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, I'm going to put the full link to this, to that interview, uh, with Jack Sarfati. So you can hear the rest of that story and everything because it's fascinating. All right, let's jump to the next thing. Um, this is interesting. So Uri Geller, who was also part of Project Stargate, okay? This is the guy that could bend spoons, all this stuff. I don't know how, you know, old some of you are, how young some of you are. You may not know, but this is an interesting sort of breakdown of this, um, you know, scenario. In the 1970s, one man shocked and dazzled the world with seemingly impossible feats of amazing psychic powers. Though many believed in his abilities, one man did not and would dedicate his entire life to revealing the truth about what he was certain was a diabolical and villainous hoax. And James Randi was a famous magician who challenged people, right, to up to a million dollars to be able to prove their psychic abilities. And no one ever cashed in on that. Um, and he always was going after Yuri Geller. Um, and we're going to take a, a, a uh, look at a clip from the Johnny Carson Carson show where Randy James Randy called in to Johnny Carson and had him provide his own props to Yuri Geller. So Yuri Geller couldn't provide his own props for boon spending or spoon bending and stuff. And you'll see what happens. It's quite interesting. That's after this. Hi, friends. I'm Matt. And recently I did a video where I tried to become a remote viewer. The session begins now. I don't know what I'm doing at all. And spoiler alert, I did, maybe? I had the idea to do that again, this time with telekinesis. And in researching this, we found out that if this was possible, which is a kind of a big if, I probably wouldn't be able to do it. But we did find a story that I do want to tell. The greatest psychic rivalry of all time. For starters, let's definitely get into what telekinesis is. Telekinesis, also known as psychokinesis, is the parapsychological phenomena of the supposed ability to move or alter objects. Again, this is all connected, right? Remote viewing, telekinesis, like it's all connected, guys. Objects with just the concentration of... Because you can't just look into one without looking into all of it. That's the truth. 
one's mind. Examples include levitating or bending objects. In the 1970s, Uri Geller exploded onto the psychic celebrity scene with his remarkable ability to, and hear me out here, bend spoons with his mind. Of course, these weren't the only skills he claimed. He was also known to possess telepathy and the ability to remote view. The Israeli-born magician quickly became known the world over for his seemingly impossible feats and was even brought in by the US government for their remote viewing focused Stargate project. But as Uri Geller's psychic star was rising, James Randi was making it his entire life's work to prove abilities just like Geller's to be completely and utterly fake. Though he became one of the country's greatest debunkers and skeptics, Randy would tell the New York Times that he preferred the title, Psychic Investigator. Randy focused his interest on paranormal and pseudo-psychic claims, including faith healers, homeopaths, spiritualists, and those... James Randy is someone to go down a rabbit hole as well. Fascinating character. ...claiming to have psychic or telepathic power. He stated that anyone who could provide scientific evidence of paranormal activity or supernatural powers would receive a cash prize. But despite offering it for six decades, nobody has ever been able to cash in. In addition to being a gigantic skeptic, Randy was also a magician and escape artist. Why would nobody try to get that million dollars, right? Like, crazy. Forming under the name The Amazing Randy. Prior to his work as The Amazing Randy, he performed as the Great Randall and performed telepathic feats. Though Randy would explain to his audience that it was simply deceit and that he was fooling them, many still believed that he held psychic abilities. There's a mentalist out of the UK called Darren Brown who does the same stuff. Um, he's quite fascinating. should look him up, Darren Brown. If you haven't seen his videos, they're absolutely amazing. I remember there was a short period of time where that's like all I watched. Uh, I watched every video, every special, every everything. The guy's absolutely amazing. He's been on Joe Rogan. Um, just a great, he's more modern, right? Like early 2000s to, to now. He's done some, honestly, absolutely amazing stuff. Uh, so check him out. It's this powerful deceit which contributed to Randy's skepticism of all those claiming psychic abilities, finding the act damaging to those deceived. As Geller gained notoriety in the 70s for his ability to bend metal with his mind, Randy was not that impressed. According to Randy, the items Geller bent with his mind were actually bent in advance and revealed to the audience as if he had bent them in real time using only his mind. The dispute would come to a head in 1973 when Randy would become partly responsible for one of Geller's most embarrassing performances ever, or I guess lack thereof. So let's take a look at that. I got it queued up right here on another video um let's go however carson wanted to expose geller as a fraud but didn't know how to do it so he called up randy randy told carson to provide the props so geller couldn't use his own spoons and to keep the props far away from geller and his crew until it was showtime when geller appeared and was presented with the tonight show provided props guess what happened he couldn't do it okay let me rest a little all right all right yep his powers failed him defeated by a comedy legend a skeptical mind and normal everyday spoons. Brewery was telling me you, you, you don't feel what, strong tonight? I don't is that? feel strong. I, I think he rather resents me. I suspect that he does, you see. No kidding, taken down. So, uh, you know, Uri Geller, I don't feel strong, right? Anyway, guys, I don't know. This is all fascinating, right? Like, what what is it? Is it real? Again, I would love to try it, but again, my biggest question is this. I keep going back to it. If remote viewing is real, then why haven't remote viewers helped us find all the UFOs? There's, if you, go, you know, Google or look on YouTube for remote viewers, they're everywhere. And people who believe in this stuff, right? Why aren't they helping us find the UFOs, right? And the future, they could be helping us uh, avoid catastrophes, wars. Look at everything that's happening in the world, right? So that's what I'm curious about. Why isn't that happening? So again, a lot of this um, remote viewing and the you know government funded research into all of this telekinesis, psychic abilities, remote viewing, right? It all got turned into a movie called The Men Who Stare at Goats, um, and it's an interesting film, uh, to be honest with you, right? Came out in two thousand nine. Let's take a look at a 30 second uh, trailer. Again, it's not, it, they don't use all the characters, or whatever. They just base it on a true story, right? 
So they base it on Project Stargate. What you are seeing is actual footage from a screening of the film The Men Who Stare at Goats. You are psychic spy on the Jedi warrior. How are we going to stop them? We don't fight with guns, we fight with our mind. Every night I would dream about that goat. Its mouth opening and closing. The goat didn't have a chance. The Men Who Stare at Goats. Rated R. So they're basically like kind of make fun of it, right? Uh, in a lot of ways. The movie's great, but they do. They kind of just make fun of this whole scenario. Um, and look, you know, you can look in the Wikipedia of it and see what it's based on and all of that stuff. It's quite interesting. Um, this is the video right here that I'm going to be putting. Uh, remember Paul Smith from Jesse Michaels' video um, about remote viewing? Uh, this is a training, so, you know, just to keep it all in the family, I guess, right? He, it's part one, you can learn how to, you know, remote view and then, you know, go through part two and whatever else, um, there is. So again, it's all quite fascinating. I don't know. What do y'all think about remote viewing? You know, is it real? Is it, um, is it fake? Can you do it? Uh, I'd be curious to know if you can, if you, in the comments, if you claim, to, to be able to do it again. I'm open to that. That's cool. I, I, I mean, how fascinating would that be to, to have that power, right? Please help us find the UFOs and the alien bodies. That would be number one, y'all, right? Please help us, help us, because that's what we need to know. Otherwise, what are you remote viewing exactly, right? Like, do you just remote view random stuff like papers on, a, on the other side of a wall or something, you know, like... Let's do something good with it if it's an actual power. So again, not closed-minded, just want to know. Again, I'm going to put links to all of this stuff. You can research it, go down the rabbit hole, tell me in the comments what I missed about it. I'll probably do another video on it down the road because it, it is interesting. Um, and again, I don't know our limits, what we can do, what we can't do. It is fascinating. So thank you all so much for watching. Please uh, hit that like button. That definitely helps out a lot. Can't wait to read the comments. And as always, please hit that subscribe button. That helps us a lot too. We're growing fast and I appreciate everyone's support. Um, again, let's keep an open mind on everything. I, I'm definitely keeping an open mind, but we're ready to call BS as well. Um, the proof is in the pudding, right? So anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for watching. We'll see you on the next video. Remember, every day is a gift. Peace. I'm Patrick with Vetted.